Tonight we, we've got a speaker who has actually worked in this area. We are on a bomb site, this library is, and he, the whole of Theobald Road was more or less wiped out in uh, a few of the raids. And he later worked in a building that was erected on the far end of the road on another bomb site, uh, cable and wireless. Um, so Hoban was an area, a small area, but actually was disproportionately affected by the Blitz. About one in seven of the properties in the old Hoban borough were either totally destroyed or badly destroyed. And although 426 people died here, in relation to the population, it was one of the worst death rates um, in relation to the population in, in London. But I'm certainly looking forward to hearing it tonight. It's one of a number of books that he's written uh, from his time in Hoban. He wrote Hoban and Bloomsbury. Mm, all right. and, uh, and I'll talk about your beer writing later. <laughs> Thank you, Malcolm. Good evening, everyone. Well, as you can imagine, it, it, it's great to be back in Theobald's Road today. As Malcolm has said, I, I worked at Cable and Wireless in this road for nearly 20 years. I got to know the locality well. I've spent many hours in this library, including the local st studies collection, and I have attended meetings in this very room. My talk tonight is based on my book about the London Blitz, which we have copies of there. <laughs> this book was published earlier this year. Just to get a few definitions in place, the events I cover in my book begin in the se September 1940 and continue around to the following July, July 1941. Another definition we need is what... This is not quite it. Sorry about that. It's important to define what London was in 1940. This is the London Civil Defence Region in 1939, which defined London for civil defence purposes. It roughly corresponded to the Metropolitan Police area and was used as the administrative basis for wartime planning and for the administration of civil defence. As you see, it ranges from Barnet in the north Croydon in the south, Barking in the east, and probably West Drayton in the west. So it's a, a huge area. This is very similar to today's um, Greater London area. The London Civil Defence Region comprised the City of London, that's a square mile, and the County of London, which can comprised 28 metropolitan boroughs, which were administered by the London County Council from their headquarters in County Hall on the embankment near Waterloo. In addition to the above, the County of Middlesex and various local authorities in Essex, Hertfordshire, Surrey and Kent were included. But for some reason of these, what was not included, although it was in the metropolitan police area, these 90 plus local authorities range from the large county boroughs of East Ham, West Ham in Essex and Croydon in Surrey, down to small urban and rural district councils. As you can imagine, it made for a huge administrative challenge. The pre-war total population of the region was 8.6 million a total which was not to be exceeded until, until, until 2015. London was the second largest city in the world, although some say it may have, were, may have been the, the largest city in the world. The outbreak of war had caused 
one of the biggest social upheavals ever. Evacuation call up, of course, contributed to this. But what happened a year later, the situation was much more fluid because no air raids had occurred in the first year of war. Some evacuees had returned and civil service, civil defense workers were un underemployed and many service personnel remained in the UK. In addition, many refugees from Europe, uh, Belgium, Holland and Gibraltar were living in London. The return of children to the metropolis was uh, somewhat concerning. In, even in November 1940, after a few months of blitz, there was probably a quarter of a million children had returned from evacuation. The situation that actually arose during the blitz was that families were wiped out. The mother and the children were wiped out while the, the father was away on sitting in barracks in the other part of England. Here we see civil defence workers on guard. Here fire watchers with stirrup pumps stand in the typical London suburban porch. Civil defence in London initially took the form of air raid precautions. These precautions were taken to mitigate the effects of the anticipated bombing onslaught. In 1938, the government instructed local authorities to submit their plans for public shelters, precautions against poison gas, evacuation, staffing of civil defense, etc. But making them comply was not easy. As today, I expect it would be a, um, a problem. They had very different attitudes, not necessarily linked to their political stances. Some boroughs were very keen, keen to protect their civilians. Others didn't want to pay for it. And others had a pacifist outlook who would rather have had nothing to do with war at all. Precautions did not entirely address the eventual reality. Particularly important was the threat of poison gas. That took up a lot of time and energy in planning. We basically had to because the legacy of the First World War was frightening and lots of people had direct or indirect experience of it. However, poison gas was never used by participants in, in this con conflict. An interesting word as we go into the Blitz is that Blitzkrieg in German means lightening war. But what, what was experienced turned out to be very different to what was planned for. I'm sorry I haven't got a, a real siren to, to sound for you, but I can assure you that <laughs> the alert was chilling and never forgotten by those who were there. Why was London bombed? Now that is a, a million dollar question because you have to be now look back at the experience and think what was the point in bombing civil civilians? but countries seem to want to do that. Um, we bombed Germany, and even today it's going on, and Ukraine is, is uh, suffering from a very similar sort of onslaught. At the time of the World War II, it was anticipated that in any future war, bombing aircraft would immediately head for Britain and unimpeded causing enormous casualties and destruction. The government and the military on both sides feared that civilians would panic. They would flee the cities and block the roads. Even a threat of bombing could do this. It was expected that industry, utilities, transport and communications would be destroyed. But these effects were grossly overestimated. Little was really known and what was known was exaggerated by anti-war and pacifist campaigners. Technology had evolved. 
After all, aircraft had only taken to the, to the skies for the first time in 1906. The experiences of World War I were significant, but they were hardly valid to use as a predictor of future events. Technology was continuing to develop, and by 1939, even the prediction that the bomber will always get through was being questioned as did the development of fighter aircraft. Claims were made for the vast amounts of, of aircraft that would be employed and the vast number of bombs that would be dropped. But little substantial evidence was advanced about the ability to put such numbers into the sky or the real effect on the target. Many questions remained unanswered. In particular, would an attack affect London only? And this is the effect of the first major air raid on London on the 7th of September, 1940. I think the, the photograph was taken early evening and it shows the whole of the East End and docks area on fire. The Blitz began on the 7th of September, 1940 with a day daylight raid by 300 bombers with supporting fighter escort. Opposition was, was negligible, which is a bit surprising. And the raid was over in an hour and a half. This was the anticipated nightmare raid. It was concentrated and it targeted accurately the East London dock, dock areas and caused mayhem with hundreds of fires, damage to industrial premises and disruption to transport. It caused severe casualties and terrified the, the population. This was very much as had been expected. A daylight of raid of relatively short duration concentrated on the important Dockland and industrial areas to the east of the city. There were over 300 fatal casualties. Now, pre-war expectations were that similar raids would follow delivering a similar weight of bombs. However, on the 7th of September, the initial raid was followed a few hours later by a long night raid, which lasted nearly to daybreak. And it was this, not its pre brief predecessor, which was to epitomize the Blitz. Long night raids continued for 57 nights, and this became a war of attrition, not a lightning war. What damage was done? Firemen at work in the London docks. Firemen, including the, including the inexperienced auxiliary fire service, had to tackle a multitude of hazards, particularly highly inflammable contents of warehouses, timber, fuel, paint, chemicals, etc. Even London's regular permanent firefighters had limited experience of the fires that developed. Fortunately, serious fires failed to materialize on many nights of the Blitz and gradually fire became a, a less of a problem. Oh, sorry. Oh, this is a very sensitive time. A burnt out cargo ship in the Surrey commercial docks. Shipping in the London docks was not too badly affected, fortunately, because some cargoes were diverted to other ports, such as Liverpool. Loss of shipping in the port of London was not too severe. This shows the, the Surrey commercial docks after the first day of the Blitz. The results were, however terrible, less than expected in terms of casualties. Once the bombing spread away from the docks, its effects became dissipated. Daylight raids gradually petered out, although some were notable. On 8th of October, 1940, fighter bombers attacked Westminster during the morning rush hour. 
now Hoban comes into the picture. Later that day, a bomb hit a restaurant in High Hoban. We think, I think this was probably before lunchtime and the restaurant wasn't open. It was called Manzoni's Restaurant. I think it was at number 12 High Hoban. The bomb demolished the building. It killed a few people in the building. But the main effect was it blasted a passing bus and um, there were 32 fatalities altogether. They, not, they are not all recorded under the borough of Hoban because most of them were not Hoban res residents. Most of them were passengers on the bus and they were taken to, to um, some to the Royal Free, Free Hospital as well as hospitals near at hand. None of the raids of, of the autumn appear, uh, approach the severity or the effectiveness of the raid on the afternoon of 7th of September. Most night raids saw over 100 aircraft attack London. The concentration went by the board and gradually all local authorities in the London Civil Defence region were affected. The population and its ARP services were ground down by it. Nevertheless, many raids were very damaging. A series of moonlight nights in October saw a number of heavy raids. Tube stations began to be hit. Incidents occurred at Brant Bounds Green, Ballam, Camden Town, and Paddington. At Camden Town, the surface buildings were badly damaged, but fortunately the platform and the train service were not affected. The worst disaster in the London Blitz was at the Coronation Avenue Flats in Stoke Newington. 160 people died there. There were also major incidents at Morley College in Lambeth and Dame Alice Owen School in Finsbury. The bomb has blasted trams under a bridge in Blackfriars Road on the 25th of October 1940. London's buses, trams and trolley buses did not stand up very well to bomb blast. The iconic red buses of London were soon joined by buses from provincial operators, which had to be drafted in to pre pre replace destroyed and damaged buses in London streets. The railways were more resilient, but most that mainline stations were put out of action for short times. The Houses of Parliament viewed from across the Thames, an iconic view, but the ruins in the foreground are those of St Thomas's Hospital, which due to its central prominent location, suffered much damage on a number of occasions. The Houses of Parliament were also badly damaged, but the, the fa this famous part of the London skyline remained intact. The, the main damage was to the House of Commons chamber, which was the only significant loss from the Palace of Westminster. Soldiers used a trolley to remove a diffused parachute mine from the Hungerford Railway Bridge outside Charing Cross. You might say, how many men does it need to, to move a parachute mine? But, but the, the work had been done then, the, 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 it was defused. The landmine or parachute mine was a significant weapon in the Blitz. The limited destructive power of the Luftwaffe's 50 kilo and 250 kilo bombs had led to the use of naval mines against the lion targets. This was, this was a practice opposed by the German Navy who naturally wanted them for use against shipping. They were 1,000 kilo mines. They were dropped by parachute and they were effective because their blast effect exceeded that of equivalent high explosive bombs. The parachute slowed down the descent of the mine, which then exploded above ground rather than below. Conventional high explosive bombs usually penetrated the ground or building before ex exploding. Parachute mines blast effect invariably caused casualties and damage over a wide area. 
irrespective of where it fell. The huge explosion of the mine and the extensive blast effect significantly impacted on civilian morale. And the landmine, as it was known, was greatly feared to the extent that any large and destructive bombing incident would be attributed to a landmine. A landmine landed probably just a hundred yards from here in uh, on the 1st of January, 1941. It was again one of these pointless bombings. I think the, that evening they dropped two parachute mines and that was it. Um, and one destroyed most of the houses on this side of Theobald's Road and some property over in uh, Gray's Inn. But, um, and it killed a few people, but you know, you have to ask what did that do to, to, you know, to support the German war effort. The mines were normally dropped in pairs. The one that dropped here, its pair dropped in the temple gardens. Unfortunately, it might have injured some people on a barrage balloon site. It didn't cause any fatalities. Their descent was sometimes affected by winds and they usually landed within a few hundred yards of each other. They were not accurate weapons, they just caused terror. Here, during the heavy air raid of the 16th of 17th of April 1941, an incredible, incredibly dangerous scenario had arisen. The mine had landed and fused itself to the live rail. After the current was turned off, the mine had to be dislodged and turned over to expose the fuse. It was a priority that this mine should be diffused and taken away quickly. It was an, in an important position on the railway tracks over which traffic had, had to be all halted. It was outside the main line railway station, which had to be evacuated, uh, as did nearby government buildings. It was diffused by Mick Gidden of the Royal Navy in a hazardous operation which took, took him until 10.30 the following morning. He was awarded for the, awarded the George Cross and I think he deserved it. In Invicta Road, Greenwich, in November 1940, rescue workers, firemen, and ambulance personnel searched the ruins of a fire station. At this auxiliary fire service station, 15 firemen died when a parachute mine reduced it to a pile of rubble. The auxiliary fire service had effective, effectively increased London's fire fighting service tenfold to enable them to meet the anticipated blitz on salt. Accommodation, of course, was needed for them. Much of this was achieved by requisition of buildings, often schools that were, were empty after evacuation. Many were hit during the blitz, although this is probably sheer bad luck. In November, pro provincial cities such as Coventry were also targeted. But the weather became less favourable and the pressure was taken off London. But effective raids still occurred. One raid on the 29th of December 1940 was to be called the Second Great Fire of London. On this night, the circumstances were unfavourable to London's defences. It was a Sunday evening during the Christmas holidays. The city was a largely res non-residential area. Business properties were deserted and unguarded. And the Luftwaffe benefited from ac accurate targeting. And in addition, the tide in the Thames was lower, which threatened the water supplies. Fortunately, the raid had to end early because the weather changed and made the French airfields used by the Luftwaffe unusable. 
raid had to end early. But poor feedback meant that the true impact of the raid, which was considerable, never reached the Luftwaffe. They assumed because they, their raid had ended early, it could not have had much impact. If they could have seen through the clouds, which obviously they couldn't, um, they were, might be able to see, but no one, they ne never got any feedback, whether any reconnaissance aircraft uh, were able to fly over England, probably unlikely in view of the weather. Targeting was good, but it wasn't quite accurate enough. Uh, the bombing should have been concentrated about a mile or, mile or so to the west of the city. Um, to the in Westminster, the raid would have had a much more significant impact if it had fallen on the government quarter. If you imagine that the West End and Westminster being completely burnt out, like the parts of the city of London were. So, although about a third of the city was eventually destroyed, there was a propaganda boost for the British. Historic buildings, rather than military or commercial targets, were the chief victims. St Paul's Cathedral survived and was shown defiant amongst a sea of smoke and fire. And this is another bad night in the city of, of London. In the winter of 1940-41, raids became less frequent and shorter. This is partly due to the weather, also partly due to a shift in attack to the provinces. Some daylight raids occurred, but the Luftwaffe had problems with the serviceability of aircraft and, and airfield usability. In the new year, the Luftwaffe made a number of sharp raids on central London. I mentioned that on the 1st of January 1941, a couple of parachute mines fell here, um, but that was about all that happened that night. On the 11th of January, it was the worst night of the war for the city of London in terms of casualties. This particular bomb hit the bank underground station. It collapsed the road into the booking hall and the crater blocked the important road junction outside the Bank of England. Blast affected the station and halted trains. There were, I think, about 80 fatal casualties. It is interesting to, to learn that the, not many of the, the casualties were actually city residents. Most of, them, most of the people were either commuters or people who used bank underground as a shelter. The other bomb that night fell on outside Liverpool Street Station where, where it hit several buses unloading passengers. See, these were just two random bomb hits that caused massive damage, nearly 100 fatalities, of whom only a few were city residents. Most were either shelterers or commuters. As with other major incidents of damage in London, remedial action was quickly instigated because there were the resources available to do that. After the initial raids in September, resources were put in place to clear debris, unblock raids, etc. There were plenty of troops available stationed in England, including the Royal Engineers, who were able to help. And they tackled this particular, particular disaster. And by May, the whole thing had been completely reconstructed, although Temporary arrangements were made for traffic to flow within a few days. The notorious Tilbury Shelter, a massive commercial road goods depot, as it was in 1905. Shelters became a huge issue once the blitz began. Again, this was because the reality was different to the pre-war plans. Provision of shelters had been on the basis of meeting the expected attack, comprising short, sharp daylight raids. Dispersal was the operative word, and advice was to avoid people congregating in main public shelters. 
this particular shelter was a, a massive warehouse which had once belonged to the London and Tilbury Railway Company, hence the name. Goods trains left the main line near Fentra Street and drew into bays under this warehouse. It looked secure. It, it had been used as a shelter in World War I, and naturally people turned to it again. But it became rapidly overcrowded as occupancy spread into areas not intended for sheltering. Condi conditions deteriorated alarmingly. This caused a high level, level of scandal, leading to political protests and questions in the House of Commons. Along with other shelters, it was un overcrowded, unhygienic, and unsafe until controls were implemented. But it was never hit by bombs, unlike many other shelters in London and elsewhere. 60 dis disasters occurred in London during the 1940-41 Blitz. A disaster was defined by the authorities as a bombing incident which over 20 people died. Virtually all these disasters ended, occurred in the London County Council area of the Metropolitan Area. <coughs> Many involved shelters. Demand emerged for deep shelters that were totally safe. This was taken up by the press as well as political agitators. As you can imagine, deep shelters had enormous costs, long constructive construction time and access access accessibility problems. It wasn't easy to get a lot of people down below the surface to these shelters, however safe they might have been. So they were never a realistic option, but a few were constructed, but they were not ready until after the Blitz was over. And, um, None were asked, actually used until the V1 attacks, the flying bomb attacks in 1944. Oh. These are rank, ranks, flour mills at Royal Albert Dock which were put out of action early in the, early in the Blitz. Over 1,800 workers were affected, uh, I put out of work by this. Um, it was a vital industrial target. And a major concern at the beginning of the Blitz was the loss of food production facilities in the docks which could not easily be replaced. For example, flour mills, oil mills, margarine factories, cold storage. The loss of actual food stocks was not such a concern because food stocks themselves could be dispersed. This is the Mazawati tea, tea Warehouse. It was partially occupied by the, by the famous tea company since 1860. It occupied a very prominent site opposite the, the Tower of London. It was wrecked on by bombing on the night of the 8th of December 1940. The building wasn't actually missed, but it was eventually demolished soon after the war. It's a reminder that the City of London wasn't just a financial centre, still had many commercial buildings, warehouses and active wharfage. But not many blatantly blocked the view of a famous historic building. It also had a huge advertising sign on its roof, which the bombing seems to actually remove. I think the interior is actually probably gutted by fire. And finally, well, not quite finally, but um, this is destruction in Chancery Lane, Hogan, uh, in September of the Blitz. Um, 
the Chancery Lane safe deposit building has been reduced to a, a mass of rubble. It's a good example of the power of high explosive and, and fire, incendiary, incendiary bonfire. The safe deposit building was raised to the ground, but the secure deposits in its underground vaults remained un intact, although serious damage was done, so that more paper documents that were stored there. Have to, we have to ask, was the blitz successful, or was it ever thought it would be? What went right for the Luftwaffe? They were effectively un, unopposed by, by night. They lost very few aircraft. Night, British night fighters were almost totally ineffective. AA fire was very noisy, which some people found encouraging, but almost it's totally ineffective. Barrage balloons only served to prevent low level attacks. London. Londoners felt they were undefended. As a result, they called for revenge. And we know what that led to. Germany was attacked on a similar basis and it ended up with such awful occurrences as Dresden. But in 1940-41, London was just too big. The effect of the raids was gradually spread out and in, out over an enormous area. Successful raids were not followed up. The raids were never concentrated enough to have a serious impact on morale, although there was much concern that it might. The civilian population of London was able to adapt, carry on, and put up with it. Before I finish my talk, I want to say something about the Blitz locally. Today's Camden, um, I don't want to I'm sure you all know this, but today's Camden obviously comprises the former metropolitan boroughs of Hoban, St Pancras and Hampstead. These boroughs were quite well prepared for the Blitz and all have extensive documentation, which quite, quite a lot here, um, surviving. London was, Hoban was probably the worst affected. It was one of the heaviest bomb, bombed localities in London. Well, this, this, despite its open spaces, its squares, parks, Gray's Inn, and Lincoln's Inn, and damage is still quite traceable today. Though the townscape is, today has been much altered by post war redevelopment, it, con it contained many hospitals, but in the borough of St Pancras were major rail stations and infrastructure. Strangely, of the stations, the mainline stations of London, Euston was surprisingly little damaged during the Blitz. St Pancras was badly damaged. Um, the major event in the latter part of the, the, the Blitz was the, the Luftwaffe Spring Offensive in 1941. They carried out four catastrophic raids on London. These are quite interesting because these were the only raids on London. Um, and they each had their own focus. They hit London very hard, but at the same time, the Luftwaffe continued its attack on provincial cities, particularly the ports. They were the only raids on London in the, this period, and the heavy casualties reflected concentration of the bombing. The complacence and war weariness also contributed. Moonlight nights bought anticipation of air raids, also, as did the fear of retaliation for RAF raids. People did not always take shelter because the raids had become spaced out. For instance, the second raid, the 16th of April, was notorious for its high level of civilian casualties because there hadn't been a raid for, for four weeks. Yet the next raid, the Saturday on the April 19th, didn't have such high fatalities in London. Many people were still on the lookout for possible attacks. Yet by the time we got to May the 10th, um, people had relaxed their guard a bit and uh, 
the worst casualties of the Blitz happened on that night. The raid on the 19th of March was a very effective raid, but it only affected East and South East London. Holborn would not have been included, affected, and probably most boroughs to, to the west of London have seen no activity at all. The April 16th raid was known as the Wednesday. It was the biggest raid on London to date, and it was the worst raid of the Blitz for Camden, particularly the borough of Hogan. Over a hundred deaths include, happened in, in Hogan. They included the bomb that fell on St. John's Church in Red Lion Square, the incident at the Dallas shelter in Torrington Place, the Jewish club in Alfred Place, and the Bourne Estate in Port Ball Lane. There was over a hundred deaths in the borough of Hope. In St Pancras, there were also over a hundred deaths, mainly it happened at blocks of flats in Pancras Square in Kentish Town. In Hampstead, a parachute mine hit Fellows Road and killed over 20 people. Sorry. Is very sensitive. This is Hope and Circus after the raid of April the 16th. The picture was taken probably only a few hours after the raid had finished. You see the Wallace's department store is completely burnt out and firefighters, the building was partially collapsed and, and firefighters are still at work. The following Saturday, the raid was said to be a birthday present for Hitler. His birthday was on April the 20th. It was the heavy, the Saturday, as it was known, was the heaviest air raid of the war on Britain. It was the only raid in which over a thousand tons of high explosive were dropped. But it mainly affected East London and metropolitan Essex. Fatalities were not as high as might be expected, so possibly because many bombs fell in areas that had already been heavily bombed and depopulated. It may, it may be that after the raid on 16th of April, people were more prepared and future ca few, fewer casualties resulted. Finally, the raid of the 10th of May. This was perceived as the worst night of the Blitz for London the most fatalities, although in terms of bombs dropped, it was less, less bombs were dropped than in, in, in the pre previous three raids. This just shows the random effect of the air raids. It was concentrated in, in areas already heavily bombed and caused Im immense damage to infrastructure. All the main line stations of London were put out of action. Most roads through the city were blocked and many areas were without gas, water or electricity. Oban did not suffer too many fatalities, but it was, there was ma massive fire damage, particularly in Fearwalls Road, where at that end of the road, virtually all the north side of the road, um, you go down the road, once you get past the Queen's Head, all that area on on, on that side of the road was completely wiped out. But fortunately, casualties were relatively low. However, in St Pancras, there were over 80 fatal fatalities. Hampstead, fortunately, didn't, didn't, wasn't affected by this raid at all. Civil defence workers, therefore, waited anxiously to see what would happen after this night but the raid was not repeated. The invasion of the USSR was soon to happen. Also that night, Luftwaffe losses were 14 aircraft, which was, which was relatively high. This indicated the beginnings of success in intercepting, intercepting and downing bombers. One further, much less heavy raid on the 27th of July, and the London Blitz was over. I hope if I've given you a taste of what happened in 
London in 1940-41. Obviously my book will be available tonight, but now I'd be quite very happy to answer any questions. Oh, you want to say the questions direct? I'm quite happy to hear. It's easier for you because you probably do see some of the people hmm. on the screen. Um, <laughs> if you do, but there's obviously a lot of people who like to ask questions. Right. So if you like to. Yes, the gentleman here. I was uh, surprised by your suggestion that the, the RAF was so unsuccessful in defending London. Was, uh, I mean, I, I can't quote the statistics, but I mean, I've read several books and they all suggested actually that the RAF actually did pretty well during the Blitz, maybe not in, in London, but overall, and actually that it shot down more aircraft than it lost. During oh, the yes, uh, I, I think that's true, but they, they could only... Repeat the question if you can, so they can hear you. Yeah. It's not it's the problem on Zoom. Yes, they sorry. can't receive the question from the audience. So, yeah. so this gentleman has asked, he believes that the RAF were, were successful in shooting down enemy aircraft during the Blitz period. I mean, my answer would be yes, they were, but it was nearly all uh, as a result of daytime activity. Nighttime, when all the Blitz activity over London occurred, they were not successful at all. And, um, but during the day, could rightly be said, yes, the, uh, the RF did very well and actually caused daylight raids to phase out, be phased out after the first few weeks of the Blitz. They never repeated the huge raid on the 7th of September. They wouldn't dare have done that again. And um, again, um, gradually the, the daylight activity went down. And a few, few uh, raids were made in, say, over the winter when the weather was bad. And that probably, uh, they got away with um, a few raids then. But I agree, the RF were very successful in, in daylight conditions. On this side, before it was bombed, there was a ah. it was, it was housing. With a little alleyway through to um, uh, John's views at the back. You haven't repeated the question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you, pardon. I was through you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, one of the questions was what was on this site before? They were 18th century houses um, with a little alleyway leading through to John's views at the back, which was interesting for the design of this building in the early days. That's why you have a back door and people in the mews used to be able to come into the building before it was actually open and walk through to the front. <laughs> and the, the buildings that were damaged along here included Disraeli's birthplace at number that was, 22. That was just a bit further along, mm. particularly um, Gray's Inn opposite was badly damaged mm. as well. And if you want to see the effects of some of the remaining, um, what happened after the war, go into Great Jane Street where when they were rebuilding some of the houses, they tried to find any bricks that they could. If you look at the buildings there, you'll see that there's all sorts of different bricks have been used to help rebuild them. Any more questions? Yes, please. I'm trying to get my head around a, a lovely quote you came up with, carry on and get on with it. Okay. So was that just normal day-to-day -day living or was that when there was a, an airway siren and uh, there was a raid going on? Do, did people naturally go and take cover or did just Carry on. Well, I think it would repeat it slightly. Yeah, the <laughs> quote. Um, did people really carry on and get on with it? Um, yes, I, I would say they did that. But you have to remember that many people in London, the majority of people, never took cover from air raids. They never sheltered. So, despite the controversies that, that people said there's not enough. Uh, sheltering facilities. Many people didn't use the facilities that, that were available. People tried to, to, to carry on as best they could. But it's not to say that a sizable minority weren't 
scared stiff and people did want to run away. But I think probably the, the majority of people, they, they felt they had no option. If you, if you ran away, you had no money, you had no job. The Anderson shelters were very popular, weren't they? The Anderson shelters were very popular. The yes, they were, but not every every property could be provided with yeah. them. They're no good for 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 um, blocks of flats, for instance. They were provided with shelters that took you know 30, 40 people. Unfortunately, a lot of those shelters were hit hit by bombs. So throughout the Blitz, you see this recurring thing in the list of war dead died at the X shelter. And it was very, um, uh, yet if people went to individual shelters, which not everyone could do, the yeah, unless an Anderson shelter got a direct hit, you, you would probably be all right. But not everyone had them. And not everyone used them because they were very susceptible to water ingress. So you, um, and then by the time it got to you know, been installed in 1939, a year later, they were all full of water. Because London, the water table is quite low in places, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we have a question online. Um, Jane Mr. Harrison, would you like to ask your question? Can, can you hear me now? I've unmuted. Yes, we can uh, hear you. <clears throat> well, following on from, first of all, thank you very much for a really interesting talk. I'm, I'm glad I tuned in. Um, but following on from what you were talking about in terms of shelters, I was doing, sorry, can you see me? Well, <laughs> you don't need to yes, see me. Yes, um, yes. Uh, I, I've been doing some research recently in the role of the into the role of the Communist Party during World War II, and of course the liberation, as they would call it, of the London Underground was a communist policy and a ruse, and it uh, managed somehow with the support, I suppose, of the population of London to convince the government to open up those shelters, and in Camden, of course. The deepest shelter is Hampstead, which was absolutely jam-packed. Mm. Um, I mean, Henry Moore used to go down there and do his drawings. Uh, and I don't think you, sir, uh, gave the Communist Party enough recognition for... Um, <laughs> uh, I can understand why, perhaps, but uh, enough recognition for what it actually achieved during the war, not just in that, that, um, uh, on that subject, but uh, across the board. I don't know well, that's quite inter interesting because the whole subject of um, under, the under, London Underground was that not all underground stations were suitable for shelter. They weren't, a lot of them weren't deep enough. None of the, what they call the inner circle and uh, subsurface lines, it would be no good going down on, say, what was Embankment Station. And sheltering down there we wouldn't give any protection at all. So shelters such as Hampstead were, were ideal, but there weren't that many of them. A, another issue was that the original plans for the Blitz based on there will be a lot of daylight raids, but they didn't anticipate the, the nighttime raids. And the night, at night, um, in the old days, before the war, the underground was closed, of course. Uh, so it wouldn't have been open anyway. And I think eventually they did realise, yes, you might as well open, you know, having these all-night all raids, you might as well open the underground. And in fact, even some like Churchill did not, wondered why they hadn't, the, the, the underground hadn't been opened. So I think, uh, I think the, the Communist Party did, do some good work in making people yeah. you know, <laughs> in uh, yeah. I, I'm surprised uh, 
hear or not to hear or about major damage to the railway stations, hmm. which I would have thought were uh, would have been major targets. Uh, I mean, I live in a house that's 200 yards south of King's Cross, which hmm. it still has all of its original two large lines. Hmm. And I often wonder why, how that is. Well, uh, the accuracy wasn't that good. Once you start dropping bombs at night, you can't really see what you're dropping them on. <laughs> <laughs> and, and surely it was goods yards which should be the target, not the passenger stations. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Should be, yeah. And, and they did have some luck with, I think, the, the, what they call the bricklayers' arms. Mm -hmm. The depot itself on the back was heavily uh, targeted, and also the Maribyrn um, uh, goods yard was was um, there was a huge fire that were work, wiped out the goods warehouse. But um, it seemed rather strange that, that King's Cross wasn't badly damaged at all. But, but on one occasion, about 20 rail work workers who were working at the goods yard were wiped out and a bomb fell on them. So a lot of it is quite um, random in, in occurrence. Uh, sorry. Just, just a quick question. From a kind of, I, I guess, architectural point of view, how many historic buildings at the moment were blocked up? How many? Are, are there any specific buildings that you point out that were lost and not rebuilt? A big I question to ask. Like, I'm just trying to think. A lot of the um, ancient halls in, yeah, in, in the city of London were livery, destroyed, as indeed were a lot of their churches. Livery, livery company yeah, halls. So. A lot of churches in the city of London. Um, it seems the city of London was just overcrowded with churches, and uh, but uh, and they they naturally were very heavily, you know, damaged. Um, uh, sorry. So, uh, my my mother there's a thing on uh, uh, um, Community Radio. As my mother, it's called my mother, the Camden Town poet, and the King's Cross bomb, and she's talking about a bomb. Um, it fell in Argyle Street. Now, I, I've asked around, and, and the pub was apparently bombed as well. And um, nobody seemed to know whether the pub, do you know whether the pub was uh, bombed in Argyle Street? Because they say no. People have said no. And I've tried to, because this story my mother tells on this, uh, on this website, on this, um, site called My Mother, the Camden Town Poet mm -hmm. and the King's Cross Bomb. Mm -hmm. And she talks of this bomb in Argyle Street, but mm -hmm. we can't see any trace of it. Yet, there is actually a little, uh, 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 opposite the pub, um, there's a little patch that could be where the bomb fell. Mm -hmm. It is possible that it, it, there are places you can look that up. But uh, the pub said no, there's no bomb. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Then, but, as, it's 80 years yeah. ago. I, how but would there, they know? <laughs> but there is, uh, there are maps of yeah. London bomb damage. You yeah. can actually inspect yeah. them at the library here, and mm -hmm. they show where the bombs and uh, which. Yeah. Are, which I, I, no, I did look at one, and it, it, it didn't include our. Well, bombs. the yeah. other place you could look is in the National Archive. Um, there are all sorts of records there mm -hmm. to you know, detail virtually every bomb that's. Well, that's a lot of research is needed to go through those. May I say, yep, I, yep. May I say something? I live in Argyle Street. <laughs> and, uh, I believe the uh, place you mentioned is... 46, my mother lived there. Was it next door to the pub? Um, 46. Well, well, I don't think yeah. that cover was bomb, but there was a bomb that landed uh, further down, further east, um, uh, more or less where the, the, the open pathway between the big blocks of flats is now, and, and right next to where the conservative county headquarters used to be. Uh, it's, it's about 200 yards further east than you're referring to. But and number 46 is now the Mordonia uh, um, Hotel. And I'm pretty sure all that's pretty much original. Yeah. yeah. Start of the street, up to 
Yeah. 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 All right. Are there any more questions? Yeah. 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 Just going back to the two actually um, parachute bombs and the one on the bridge there. Yeah. Uh, what sort of training? Are you talking about the Royal Engineers? How did they know how to deal with these modern bombs when the First World War came out 20 years before? No, no. They just very good at maths or something. Mm. Well, there were two aspects to it. Mines, being naval mines, were left to the Navy, uh, and they dealt with them. And but, but normal high explosive bombs were dealt with by bomb disposal. And there were, there were some experts, but they had to train lots and lots of people because they found that after the blitz began, 10% of bombs dropped, did not, did not explode, and they had no way of telling whether they were duds or perhaps there were de delayed action types. So it was all a question of very rapid learning curve. Yes, I don't have to, uh, you know, press that thing. You know, it was a lot of trial and error. And the, <laughs> the horrific casualties amongst bomb disposal personnel. Yeah. One, that's only one, one I, guy I told you about, it was only one George Cross, there were lots of them. <laughs> The next one. Yeah. The next. Uh, Mr. Wolven, would you like oh, Robin to Wolven, yes. pose your question? Yes, uh, yes I would. Yes, we, first we of, can hear First you. of all, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, right. Uh, well, once again, thanks. That was uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, I like the book, but why haven't you got an index, John? <laughs> ah, that, that's oh, a very good I mean, question. You, you've got lots of incidents and dates and whatever, but um, uh, it would be very useful if you had an index in, in a book of this style. It would be, but the bulk of the book is uh, um, chronological. So uh, I, I agree entirely. And the other, re I just felt that an, an index would end up with loads of places. Uh, people, yeah, just that, one, one reference. But that, that's the problem. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, no, a, no, it's, sorry. A, it's a marginal decision. <laughs> and could I make a point on uh, the previous uh, questioner, uh, Jerry Harrison and the, and the Communist Party? Um, I think what he's going to find is the propaganda that was put out by the party, the nonsense about them being responsible for opening the tubes is plain nonsense. Mm -hmm. The tubes were going to be opened in any case, mm -hmm. and uh, before they were officially opened, I think it was the 21st of uh, September, I know that's two weeks after that started, mm -hmm. uh, but um, you could actually buy a, um, a, a, a ticket and get on the uh, platform if you really wanted to. Exactly. No one was going to chuck you off. <laughs> and uh, the whole point about the tubes is that uh, they used to do regular uh, tube census evenings, and on the uh, occasion when the falls, uh, when the uh, tubes were most full, they had 177,000 people in the tubes, and that was 4% of London's population. Exactly. I agree entirely that most people thought they were safer off in bed or under the bed. And uh, that's uh, confirmed by all sorts of people. Anthony Heapenis' diary, uh, and when I interviewed uh, Barbara Castle, sorry, Lady Castle, uh, on this very point, and she was an ARP warden in St Pancras, uh, she did not go to shelters other than uh, social visits to see how her uh, constituents were uh, coping. Thanks. 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 Well, there is. Oh. One more question was there one more? Yes, yeah. 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 Um, my grandmother had a shop in Resing Road, uh, not far from Argyle Street, mm. almost backing onto it, mm. and she was bombed in 1940. And it's not on that book, the bomb maps thing, is mm. it? Mm. Not, um, the, the, not no, the, the bomb. There's a whole um, uh, book of those maps. London Fire Brigade. 
produced uh, maps. Yeah, and there's there's also maps and called uh, um, a website called Bomb Site, but that is it's the Bomb Site one that only starts on the first of October, nineteen forty, oh. which obviously leaves out quite a lot of uh, um. incidents. So that's probably one reason I can't always <laughs> yeah. find everything you might well, want to look. Find out from the people. Were killed, were they registered well, death, the people so? who were killed can be looked My at. My grandmother wasn't, she was out that day. Uh, if you know people who were killed, you can find them on the um, roll of the right. mm -hmm. roll of, of civilian war death. Yes, yeah, there's, you there's can, a copy here for St. Pancras. And uh, yeah. you can look at all boroughs or, yeah. in London and you can get them in date order if you want to right. and that will this is a definitive list of everyone who really? died could we take the last question from I, I was just going to make a quick point that there are really two sets of maps there's the, the easily available bomb damage maps yeah. mm -hmm. which cover everything yeah. pretty much everything mm. they exclude certain official buildings so you look for them you won't find any uh -huh. because they they were assessed for the purposes of insurance mm -hmm. And compensation. And the other thing is that the the other interesting maps are the bomb plot maps that were designed to enable the authorities to a look for what for the bombs with a ten percent loss rate. So they knew they were looking for others. And also um, as an intelligence gathering exercise to find what one of them got as well. There's a lot of sources on all many issues to do with the Blitz, and not all all of them square up to each other, unfortunately. The, the sheer horror of it, but I, I was reminded of that every year. When I moved into Watford 50 years ago, uh, a minute or two before the 11 o'clock on the 11th of November, a wartime siren was set off from the roof of Bushy police station. And then two minutes later, it sounded again. Mm -hmm. So we had that until about 15 years ago, until they were decommissioned. Now, the Bushy Museum that I'm a member of wanted to get one for their collections, but the government wouldn't allow it because they were secret. A wartime <laughs> thing. <laughs> they just couldn't get, they just couldn't get hold of one. Uh, but there we are. But um, last week, I was sitting in my local pub having a quiet pint, reading the Campaign for Real Ale um, journal, um, London Drinker. Yeah. And there's a review <laughs> of it, of oh, your book. Oh, I know, yeah. <laughs> because John was previously, when he was a heavy drinker, a heavy drinker that, but also um, the chair of the North London branch of camera. Yeah. So we normally give our speakers as a thank you some publications, but on this occasion, uh, as a fellow camera member, I thought it more appropriate to give you some bottles of bottle, con uh, uh, bottle condition ales from a small microbrewery in London. Very kind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> anyway, the book is yeah. Uh, book copies well, of the book for sale and uh, discounted price is thirteen pounds. Uh, 13 pounds. Now. Yeah.